Good morning and welcome to today's webcast. What to know about the SEC proposed rules on insider trading. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thank you for viewing our webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And Toby, I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Welcome, and thank you for viewing our webcast series. Awesome. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Thanks for bearing with us. A couple um, technical challenges here getting started. I am Toby Johnston. I am a partner in the private client practice here at Moss Adams and want to welcome all of you. Thanks for taking some time with us to learn a little bit more about insider trading. Uh, we're going to start with some brief introductions. Um, I lead the executives practice at Moss Adams. Um, like I said, I'm a tax partner, been doing this for about a little over 20 years now and um, do a lot of equity compensation planning with uh, founders and execs. We've got Greg Watts joining us today. And uh, Greg um, is an old friend and uh, very good at what he does. I'm gonna read his intro um, because it says a lot of great things about him and I know he, he wouldn't say this himself, but Greg's a partner at Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati, where he is the co-head of the firm's nationwide securities litigation group. For almost 25 years, Greg has represented companies and their directors and officers in defense of securities class actions, shareholder derivative M&A challenges, corporate governance lawsuits, and SEC investigations and enforcement actions. Over his career, Greg has defended uh, against lawsuits and investigations in 15 states and for such companies and clients as Costco, Domo, Google, Globus Medical, Pluralsight, and Starbucks. Greg started his career in Silicon Valley, which is where I met him, and he currently works out of the firm Salt Lake City and Seattle offices. So we're really excited to have Greg join us. Um, he also wouldn't tell you that it, it seems like he's on every super lawyer list in America, but one of the best at what he does, and we're excited to talk with him. I'm going to let uh, Ben Shively uh, briefly introduce himself. Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Shively. I'm a partner at Moss Adams in our private client group. I've uh, been with the firm for a little over 12 years, work with Toby to help lead our uh, executive practice, um, spend most of my time helping executives uh, manage around their concentrated equity in public and pre-IPO companies. And uh, I sit on the firm's investment committee where we manage a few billion in assets um, and spend a lot of my time working uh, with executives on planning around their balance sheets. Thanks, Ben. We've also got Aaron McFarland. I'm not going to have him introduce himself at this time, but Aaron is going to be monitoring the chat for questions. Um, and we would encourage you to submit questions and he'll chime in um, at appropriate times with those. Um, if the questions are off topic, we will reserve those until the end and, and try to get to as many as we can. So uh, we do have some polling questions. That first polling question is open now. I accidentally opened it. Um, and these polling questions, some of them are a little self-serving, but they're to help us get a sense for who's joining us today so that we can try to tailor some of the discussions uh, to meet your needs. So I've, I've attended recently um, other uh, webinars on this topic, and they got really pretty deeply technical. 
Um, we're, we're taking a little bit different approach today. We want this to be more conversational in tone with Greg and more practical. So we're hoping that um, each of you will, will walk away with some information, um, something practical that you can implement at your company or maybe for yourself personally if you are a corporate insider. So with that, uh, <clears throat> it looks like most of you have answered this first polling question. And so I'm going to advance and we'll see kind of who's, who's with us here. About 39% of you are on the corporate executive side, a few stock plan administrators, and then a number of you, about half of you, are in a supporting role or serving um, either a company or a corporate exec in, in one of these roles. So, Ben, why don't you kick us off uh, with the first question for Greg? Thanks. Yeah, we're going to, as Toby mentioned, we're going to be talking about insider trading and 10 b one trading plans. Going to be asking Greg some questions uh, on those topics. So to kick it off, Greg, um, for those of us that need a refresher, uh, can you give us a brief overview of insider trading? Yeah, sure, Ben. Um, and by the way, thank you to Moss Adams, Ben, and Toby for the invitation. It's an honor to be with all of you. Um, so what is insider trading? Um, you know, Congress enacted the federal securities laws to promote fair uh, and transparent securities markets, avoid frauds, and to substitute a philosophy of caveat emptor for one of full disclosure. Um, the securities laws anti-fraud provisions contain uh, prescriptions against insider trading, and they play an essential role in maintaining the integrity and the fairness of our markets. Um, illegal insider trading refers generally to buying or selling a security in breach of a fiduciary duty or other relationship of trust or confidence on the basis of material non-public information about the security or the issuer. Rule 10 b 51 provides that purchase or sale of an issuer security is on the basis of material non-public information about the security or issuer if the person making the purchase or sale was aware, that's the key language, was aware of material non-public information when the person made the purchase or sale. So what does the SEC define as being aware of uh, material non-public information? Being aware of in this context means the person, quote, knows, consciously uh, avoids knowing, or is reckless in not knowing that the information is material and non-public. Uh, close quote, that's from a US, U.S. Supreme Court decision a few years ago. So insider trading violations may also include tipping such information to others, securities trading by the person who was tipped, um, and securities trading by those who misappropriate such information. Um, common examples of insider trading would be what you would expect, would be corporate officers or directors trading in the corporation's securities after learning of market moving news that has not yet been disclosed to the market. These are typically confidential corporate developments. Um, other, other insiders or people who can violate tr uh, trading rules would be friends, business associates, family members, or other tippies of such officers, directors, or employees who share that information with them and then trade on that information. And then finally, uh, a, a Sadly, a growing, um, a growing population of people would be employees of professional advisors like law firms, investment banks, accounting firms, who learn information based upon that professional relationship with their clients, but then trade on that information um, in connection with the providing those services. Thanks. Can, can you give some examples of um, insider trading or of material non-public information? Yeah, there are so many and, you know, some of them are quite famous. Um, the one that I, you know, I read Den of Thieves when I was in um, an undergraduate. Um, that's the story of Michael Milken and Ivan Boski in the 1980s. Um, Michael Milken tipped off Ivan Boski regarding companies that were privately evaluating merger opportunities. Uh, Boski bought the target company stock before the company disclosed this information to the public thereby making a fortune uh, from this inside information when the target company stock price shot up upon that news being publicly disclosed. Um, Boski settled civilly with the SEC uh, on an incident trading charge paying $100 million 
Uh, criminally, Boski was sentenced to three years in prison and served 18 months of that sentence in order to pay uh, a small fine of $250,000. Uh, criminally, Michael Milken pled guilty to one count of securities fraud and was sentenced to 10 years in prison, but only served roughly two years of that sentence. Uh, as part of his plea bargain, Milken agreed to pay back $600 million uh, in fines and restitution. Uh, he was recently pardoned by President Donald Trump due to his post-sentencing um, philanthropy in the area of prostate cancer and other areas. Another example is um, James McDermott. He was a CEO of a Wall Street investment bank, and he passed uh, tips along to uh, his mistress about pending bank mergers. This mistress then traded on her advanced knowledge and profited roughly $80,000. McDermott pled guilty to a count of insider trading and spent five months in prison and paid roughly a quarter of a million dollars in restitution, interest, and penalties. One that's been, I think, one of the more famous instances would be Martha Stewart. Um, there, the SEC filed suit against uh, uh, Ms. Stewart and her stockbroker, alleging that um, he tipped her off that two of his other clients, a pharmaceutical company CEO and his daughter, were dumping their shares in the company stock in advance of an FDA announcement. Uh, Ms. Stewart then sold her small position in the company stock. In her settlement with the SEC, uh, Ms. Stewart agreed to pay $190,000 in disgorgement and penalties and suffered a five-year bar on service as a public company uh, executive or director. Uh, while she was not convicted of insider trading, uh, she was convicted for obstruction of justice in connection with that investigation and served a five-month five prison sentence. Another example is um, London and Shaw. London, an accounting firm partner, shared tips with his clients, uh, on his clients with Shaw, a golfing buddy. Um, Shaw was uh, a struggling jewelry shop owner. Um, unbeknownst to London, Shaw was making big trades in those company stocks on most tips, profiting roughly 1.3 million. London accepted cash and gifts from Shaw. London was convicted of insider trading and sentenced to uh, 14 months in, in prison, and Shaw cooperated and received a five-month sentence. Uh, two of the more recent examples would be uh, Raj Rajaratnam, who is the chief of hedge fund Galleon. Uh, he was found guilty for being the mastermind of an insider trading network where tips were traded among the members of the group. Uh, he was sentenced to 11 years in prison, fined 10 million, and forfeited almost $54 million in profits. Uh, he served nine years of that sentence and is now out. And finally, um, the story of Billy Walters and Phil Mickelson. Uh, Walters provided financial support to a director of Dean Foods. Um, that relationship developed such that the director started providing Walters with material non public information about the company. Uh, Walters then traded on that information. Um, Walters, a friend of Phil Mickelson, passed these tips along to Phil, who also traded on the information. Walters was fined $10 million and sentenced to five years in prison. Uh, Phil Mickelson avoided prosecution because no one could prove he knew the source of the tips. So those are some examples of insider trading activities and the relating penalties. You talked you talked a little bit about the, the penalties in those specific instances. Can you, can you give a general overview of the criminal and civil penalties for insider trading? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so the, the SEC civil remedies, uh, they don't have criminal remedies, only civil uh, against individuals include disgorgement of the profit from the insider trading plus interest, penalties of up to three times the alleged illicit profit, and a possible lifetime bar from service as a public company director or officer. Approximately half of the time when the SEC brings a civil enforcement action, the Department of Justice also brings a criminal uh, indictment or vo for violations of the federal securities laws. The criminal penalties against individuals include a maximum of $5 million, disgorgement of ill-gotten gains, restitution, and as, as much as 25 years in prison. To put it in context, you know, over the last um, you know, five years, so during the Trump administration and now into the first year of the Biden administration, roughly the number of 
uh, enforcement actions brought by the SEC are between 40 and 50 um, annually. And usually that involves a number of individuals between 50 and 75. That's roughly 6% of the SEC enforcement staff's civil standalone administrative proceeding docket. So it's a small percentage of the total, but a very important piece that I believe under the Biden administration will ratchet up in the next you know, two and a half years. Hey, um, Greg, we got a, a quick question here. Are you familiar with the partner at KPMG that was caught trading on inside information? Uh, yes, that was one of the examples I mentioned, which was the accounting firm. Gotcha. Um, that was London and Shaw. Yeah. That would be one. Thanks for and there, that. There are more. Thanks for that overview. Um, switching gears to some of the tools used to prevent insider trading and to manage that safely, can you describe a little bit about what a 10B51 trading plan is? Uh, yeah, sure. So, you know, in, in August of 2000, which was, you know, 22 years ago, the SEC adopted Rural 10B51, which provides corporate insiders an affirmative defense to a charge of insider trading liability in circumstances where the trade was pursuant to a binding contract and instruction to another person to execute the trade for that person's account or a written plan adopted when the insider was not aware of any material non-public information. This marked the dawn of the 10B51 trading plan we're all familiar with or have heard of. Today, officers and executives and directors at over half of the S&P 500 uh, use these plans. In order to provide an affirmative defense, the real 10B51 trading plan currently must, number one, not have been entered into when the person was aware of material non-public information. Typically, that means they will enter into these plans or adopt them with their, with their broker um, during an open trading window following the disclosure of quarterly um, financial information. Number two, uh, the, the plan must either specify the amount of securities to be purchased or sold, the price and the date, or provide a written formula or an algorithm for determining those amounts, prices and dates, or not permit the person to influence the trade made by another on his or her behalf. Um, and then finally, um, number three would be that, that the plan must have been entered into in good faith and not as a part of a plan or scheme to evade the federal securities laws. Perfect, thank you. We're gonna move into our, our next polling question. Take a second here just to gather some more information. Are you a corporate insider subject to the SEC insider trading rules? Just getting a little more sense of how everyone deals with, with these issues. more seconds here no problem i can't wait to see the response to this okay top 50 50. so unless you're an outside service provider your answer could be yes um, because anyone at a company can be privy to material non-public information from the from the most senior executives to the lowest level employees that they run into a meeting or learn something about the company uh, that is material and non-public. Um, I've had situations where somebody who sends out invoices uh, that sat next to somebody who was aware of uh, a key um, merger negotiation basically um, use that information to trade on inside information. So it can be even the lowest of low in the, in the hierarchy of a company who could still be privy to that information. Thanks for that uh, distinction there, Greg. So you, I think you've done a good job of kind of setting the setting the table for what the existing law is, insider trading, 10B51 plans. Um, but the SEC, um, at, I guess late last year, proposed some changes. And so um, both to um, how corporate insider, to 10B51 plans, as well as to, um, I believe, uh, company stock repurchases. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what the new rules would be under these proposed changes? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, Chairman Gensler and the SEC staff took a break from hounding unicorns, um, going after the crypto markets and blockchain and, um, you know, general concerns about um, uh, SPACs to focus at least briefly on uh, 10B51 trading plans and their, per their perception of abuses in the use of those plans. These proposed amendments to the 10B51 trading plan rules are intended to try to avoid or minimize the level of gamesmanship they believe is going on among executives uh, in using these plans. There are essentially 10 amendments to the 10B51 trading plan regime that we currently understand. And I can tick through each of these, we can talk about them, and feel free to send any questions in the chat and uh, Ben or, or Aaron can let me know. But you know, so first and foremost, um, the, the new rule, proposed rule would require that a ten, rule 10B51 trading plan must be entered into, when it's entered into by officers and directors, must include a 120 day mandatory cooling off period after the adoption. So you adopt the plan today, the first trade in that plan cannot take place for 120 days. Um, and by the way, it's not just adoption, but if, if you modify a plan, amend it in some way, that resets the clock on your 120 days under this new regime. Now, the current rule does not impose any cooling off period. A plan could trade the day it is adopted, although experienced advisors and uh, you know, lawyers and accountants uh, and brokers would advise uh, executives to try to keep a 90-day rule for cooling off, or at least until after the next quarterly window opens. Um, that's the, the best practice. Um, now, a modification to a plan which will reset the clock of 120 days um, would include any cancellation of one or more trades, and that would be deemed equivalent to basically terminating the plan and resetting that clock. So under the current regime, you could cancel a trade or cancel a plan, put a new plan in place the very next day. Here, there would be a 120-day cooling off period. Uh, that's the first major amendment to the, the Rule 10B51 trading plan regime. Uh, the second deals with not in individuals, but with, inside, with, uh, with issuers. Um, with issuers, there will also be a mand mandatory cooling off period of 30 days um, after adoption of the plan. Same, same, same general rule, shorter time frame. Um, the current rule, again, does not impose a cooling off period on issuers. A plan could trade the same day it is implemented. The SEC is concerned that insiders are orchestrating the announcement of issuer share repurchases in order to boost the company stock price while simultaneously instituting personal trading plans that will allow them to benefit or profit from the resulting stock price pop. So they're trying to implement that change. Um, the, the, the third amendment re requires officers and directors to personally certify that they are not aware of material non-public information about the issuer or the security when they adopt a real 10B51 trading plan and that they are adopting the plan in good faith and not as part of a scheme uh, or plan to evade Section 10B, the anti-fraud provision of the securities laws. Uh, it is not required to be filed with the commission, uh, but since the issuer must disclose adoption of 10B51 trading plans, all investors and the SEC will presume that the director or officer who has such a plan signed such a certification. Now, the plaintiff's bar has tried mightily over the last decade to turn Sarbanes-Oxley or SOX certifications into themselves actionable false statements under the securities laws. They have been successful in some courts, not all but some. They would do the same here with this certification, in my opinion, arguing that the certification was a false or misleading statement and constitutes an actionable claim uh, in a securities fraud lawsuit. Now, while the SEC's release on these proposed amendments states that these certifications would not provide an independent basis for a Section 10B violation, it would be used in conjunction with other alleged false statements. Um, the, the fourth proposed amendment um, is to amend the rule to, uh, that it would only allow the affirmative defense uh, if the 10B51 trading plan was adopted and operated in good faith. 
Um, I'll talk more about what I don't like about this provision, but the and operated in good faith is incredibly vague and troublesome to me. Uh, the SEC is concerned about executives delaying or accelerating the release of material non-public information to benefit their predetermined trades. And they're also concerned about executives canceling uh, trades or modifying plans in an attempt to avoid a low-priced or disadvantageous trade, which is something the market calls bullet dodging. Um, the fifth uh, amendment to the rule would be that uh, Rule 10b-5-1, the affirmative defense uh, against the claim for insider trading does not apply to multiple overlapping 10b-5-1 trading plans or arrangements for open market trades. What this means is that some executives would implement more than one 10b-5-1 trading plan, have them overlap in some way uh, with different brokers potentially, or uh, with one for their family trust, one for themselves personally, one for their spouse, um, or others in their family. Um, the current rule only precludes the use of this affirmative defense if um, the individual engages in corresponding or hedging transactions or positions with respect to the planned transactions. The SEC here, I think, in making this amendment believes that the use of multiple trading plans could be used to simulate this kind of impermissible hedging because uh, the plans may have different um, dates, price points, algorithms, and they can each be canceled under the current regime. So you could put in three, cancel two, and leave the one that would be advantageous uh, to you in the current trading price. So they're, they're concerned about that, um, that, that potential misuse. Um, the Sixth Amendment um, is that if an insider has a single trade plan, a plan where they're going to make one trade at one time, and then the plan is, is, is done, it limits the availability of the rule and the affirmative defense to one single trade plan during one calendar year, 12-month 12, uh, 12 period. Uh, there cannot be multiple single trade plans in place that overlap or that even trade in a 12-month period. Um, number seven requires prompt disclosure of gifts of securities by insiders on Form 4 within two business days after such gift is made. Under the current regime, uh, individuals have 45 days to file in their form for. Now it's going to be two, two business days, a very short turnaround. Um, the, the eighth amendment would require a whole new disclosure regime for issuers where they would disclose quarterly uh, uh, the adoption or termination of any 10B51 trading plan by executives or any other trading arrangements by directors, officers, and, issu and the issuers, and the terms of such trading arrangements. Meaning, if a plan was implemented during the last quarter, the issuer would have to disclose the, the duration of the plan, the, the person implementing the plan, and the number of shares they anticipate selling pursuant to that plan over the course of the life of that or duration of that plan. That's a lot of disclosure. We'll talk about that in a minute. but. Um, now, the current rules have no such mandatory disclosure requirements. So, but properly advised companies, however, have been disclosing in the form four in a footnote when there's a trade pursuant to a plan that is that that trade is pursuant to the plan and identifies the plan date of its adoption to help create some cover to show the market and those who read the form that the trade was really a decision was made long ago and the trades are executing on the on the um, the plan itself. Um, so that really is, to me, a, a concern, which is disclosing um, the duration and the aggregate number of securities to be sold pursuant to a plan. This provides a huge signal, as you all, I'm sure, appreciate to the market, that many issuers and executives would rather not send. Um, it makes diversification of assets and uh, risk for executives more of a political problem vis-a-vis -vis the investor base and could result in front-running by certain uh, investors. In fact, one could argue that the 10B51 plans for senior executives are themselves material non-public information because the disclosure of them will likely send ripples through the market in which investors will use it to determine the executive's bullishness or bearishness about the company's prospects. Um, yeah, that's so, interesting, Greg. That, you know, it, it does sound like some of these uh, new amendments might have unintended consequences. Um, 
you started to one of the earlier amendments. I'm not sure which one it was, um, but it seemed like you weren't much of a fan. Um, are there any of these ten in, in the? Pardon me if you didn't get to the tenth one, but are in, are there any of the ten that you see as particularly bothersome or or something that doesn't seem very practical or gets yeah. you fired up? Yeah. So I, I tend to get fired up a lot about um, regulators who put in rules on what I believe to be thin information or just concerns uh, that are on um, on unduly or not properly researched. So I think more study is required before implementing such dramatic changes to the to, to rule 10B51. Um, in, in my firm's SEC comment letter on the proposed rules, we advocated for implementing only the cooling off period and not for 120 days, but something closer to 90 or into the next trading window and holding off on the rest until the SEC and others can do more research on these perceived abuses um, and allow them to gather more information. So here, here are my problems with the current proposed rules. I hope the SEC listens to some of my complaints. Um, the, the, proposed, the proposal does not address the effect of any new rules on pre-existing trading plans. So insiders should be allowed and not be penalized for relying upon the commission's then existing rules when their plan is adopted. So if I adopt a plan today, the rule goes into effect in April during the course of my one year plan, are they gonna change the rules out from under me during my plan, during this time of its, its duration? That shouldn't be allowed. We should be grandfathering in all plans until they run their course over the next year or two. They shouldn't be subject to the new rules. Um, I think that the new rules create a huge administrative burden on corporations and individuals. And um, there should be, I think, a phase in period to allow companies to sort of ratchet up and adopt these new disclosure uh, obligations um, and to make these rules you know, effective. Um, on the cooling off period, as I said a little while ago, I think 120 days is unnecessarily long and should better be dictated by the company in its own sort of disclosure um, uh, situation. Uh, you know, a 2016 survey um, showed that 75% of respondents had a cooling off period of 60 days or less, half of what the SEC proposes. So it's going to be a very big change to people if this really is implemented. Instead of a one-size-fits-all approach, I think that the, 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 the commission should allow issuers to decide based upon their specific circumstances. For example, I personally believe that a 90-day cooling off period is probably the best. It's an entire quarter, right? Um, and really one that could be modulated higher or lower based upon when the company's next trading window opens. I also think that the cooling off period should have a hardship exception, uh, such as an unanticipated financial liability that is unrelated to trading activity that should allow someone to trade if they've got, had a divorce or whatever the reason might be to, to, to sell some stock outside the plan. Um, I think the certification is unnecessary and could be used in a way to manufacture a claim of an additional false statement by the SEC or by the plaintiff's bar. Um, and I think that if they hold true to their, their questions to, to folks for comment, they are even thinking about making this applicable to non-Section 16 officers going lower in the organization. That would be, I think, too unwieldy. Um, I have concerns about the overlapping plan uh, prohibition. I think the SEC should clarify that the 120-day cooling off period should permit the overlapping of plans so long as the trades within those plans do not overlap. So for example, uh, to maintain a consistent 10B51 um, trading regime using a series of one-year plans, an executive would need to adopt a new plan 120 days before the current plan expires. So they would be overlapping. They need to clarify in their language in the proposed rule that that isn't a, a, a violation of Rule 10b 51 prohibiting an affirmative defense. You should be allowed to implement overlapping plans as long as the trades don't overlap, if that makes sense. Um, I think the SEC should clarify that a single open market transaction um, that is not made pursuant to a 10b 51 trading plan 
is not an overlapping trading arrangement that therefore precludes use of the affirmative defense. Um, I think that the SEC should clarify that sales to cover, right? In other words, sales to cover the tax obligations, for example, the vesting of RSUs, uh, should not be deemed to be an overlapping trading arrangement, and they shouldn't lose their defense in that circumstance. And I also think that many, many of my clients, many of your clients, I'm sure, Toby, um, they trade in both a personal account, probably a family trust account, and maybe even one or two others. Um, even when our clients try to synchronize those multiple accounts and therefore you know, similar or even identical trading plans, under the current language in the proposed rule, those would be three overlapping plans and therefore preclude the affirmative defense. That isn't fair. Just because you've organized your finances in a way where you're trading to multiple accounts, maybe with different brokers, you should be allowed to have that coordinated approach without losing your, your defense. Um, you know, my biggest concern, my biggest concern, Toby, is the language that the staff want to put in, uh, which is that the plan must be operated in good faith. I hate this provision. Good faith is not properly defined in the, in the proposed regulation, in the rule. This type of vague language provides the SEC, the DOJ, with such great leeway that no one will really ever know if they have their affirmative defense available to them or not. It allows the government and the private securities litigation bar to flip 10B51 on its head. They will use it to create great mischief among corporate executives. They will compare the timing of disclosures to predetermined 10B51 trading trades and argue that the information was timed to benefit the executive's trades. So a regulation designed to provide an affirmative defense is then turned into one which can be used as evidence of basically dishonest disclosure. You know, one SEC commissioner said that 10 b 51 plan should be a, quote, set it and forget it proposition. Unfortunately, under the disuse of the, you know, operated in good faith language prevents that. It's impossible. Insiders are therefore forced to constantly evaluate the company's disclosure of market moving information relative to where their trading plans, predetermined trades will execute consult with somebody, either personal counsel or company counsel, it's just going to be a mess. I think they should clarify the language or remove it all, all together. So it sounds like you're, you're, you're pretty much in agreement with the amendments then, right? <laughs> <laughs> just a, a short list of grievances. I think Aaron's got yeah. a question that came in from the chat. Yeah, thanks, Toby. Greg, you, you spoke a little bit about the cooling off period proposal and we received a specific question about the cooling off period so I'll read it and uh, would appreciate you weighing in um, so the question is it seems that there aren't any rules against canceling a 10 b 51 plan if the price changes I've seen the price of the company's stock move significantly so then the executive cancels the 10 b 51 plan so that no exercise and or sale occurs do the new cooling off periods only apply to initiating trades within 120 days, or does it also go the other direction to cancel the plans and not have an action? Yes. Yeah, so what will happen is, is that the, under the new regime, so you're right, under the current regime, many executives will cancel a plan before a trade executes so that that trade never takes place. Under the new proposed rule, what would happen is that if you do cancel a plan, you basically that's that or, or um, amend a plan in some way that resets the clock for 120 days, which means you therefore um, have to, to wait that long for the next trade. And quite frankly, they're going to require you that to, to wait those days before you implement the new plan, right? So it's going to be one where when you cancel, you're going to have to sit on the bench essentially for a period of time before you get that next plan implemented. And the, the concern I've always had, and that this concern will continue, is that when individuals act outside of their plan, either by trading outside the plan or canceling a plan by you know what some have called bullet dodging, that can be used as evidence against you that you did something unusual and natural, uh, unplanned, that could be used as evidence for a motivation to, to benefit from material non-public information. So the plaintiff's bar is not 
fully into this yet, but I think some are thinking about it, which is to use aberrant trades outside plans as truly suspicious because the plan sets forth where you should be trading. And when you trade elsewhere, it means you're doing something unusual. Yeah, it sounds like uh, the SEC is definitely trying to, to, to broaden the net here. Even with the current rules, I've, I've heard you tell a story or two, Greg, about um, uh, what was deemed to be insider trading that didn't seem too obvious, at least to me, on its face. Um, have there been any recent enforcement actions or, or any stories you would care to share about um, trades that were deemed improper um but weren't weren't too obvious yeah and this is where we, we we all should be very careful so in 2016 the u.s supreme court ruled that the tipper need not receive personal financial benefit from the tip so long as the tippy is a family member or friend the relationship is enough even without a relationship, non-monetary but valuable benefits could qualify as enough to convict a tipper. This could be a reputational benefit, getting your, your kid into a prestigious college or preparatory school, membership in a, in a private club or a golf club, introduction to a powerful politician, um, any personal professional services provided for free or at a discount, all that could be used uh, without actually exchanging cash to put you on the line for tipper liability as an executive. Uh, a, a very recent and unusual, and in my view, aggressive uh, complaint filed by the SEC is the following. In the fall of last year, the SEC charged a, a corporate biz dev executive who learned about an impending acquisition of his employer and then traded in the securities not of his own company, but of an unrelated company in the same industry that he anticipated would increase in price when his employer's acquisition was publicly announced. So the SEC's complaint alleges that the defendant, a biz dev exec at an oncology focused biopharma, learned from his CEO that the company expected to be acquired by a major pharma company within a few days at a premium well, of course, above the then market price. The biz dev executive did not trade in his own company stock. Uh, instead, within minutes of hearing of the news, he purchased out of the money call options in another oncology focused biopharma that he believed would um, increase in value when the market formed the belief there was gonna be a roll up in the, in the industry and that big pharma was gonna be buy more of these similar type companies. Um, his company's insider trading policy prohibited him from profiting from the company's material non-public information by trading either in his own. And that's where he got caught. Um, the other biopharma's stock price did rise by 8% when that news was disclosed, and he did make roughly $100,000. He's now been sued by the SEC. That, to many people, is surprising. You can be on the hook for another person, another company stock based upon information about your own company. Yeah, that seems that does seem incredibly broad to me. I mean, we have clients that, you know, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and uh, you know, when news comes out from one of these mega techs, it, it, I mean, it can move the the whole market pretty easily, right? And so, it just seems uh, quite aggressive that the SEC would would pursue those channels. So that that case hasn't um, finalized yet, right? That's still ongoing to see what happens there that's correct yeah we'll be interested to see what ultimately happens we're going to move on to our next uh, uh polling question um do you have a 10b51 plan currently in place Let's see what percentage of you and going back i know um this would probably only really be relevant to the those who are deemed corporate insiders or maybe those who answered that they were um, executives uh, back at the beginning. <clears throat> Give this another minute here. And then uh, we'll turn it over to Ben to uh, ask some questions about kind of where, where we go from here with these proposed changes. And while we're waiting for the polling answer, I want to make one editorial comment, which is 
you know, the SEC has concerned about a perceived abuse of executives canceling plans to avoid a trade at a disadvantageous price. What I have seen personally is the opposite, which is I see Section 16 officers decide to cancel a plan because the trade is too advantageous and they're concerned the market will view that as a um, too well-timed trade, even though subject to a 10B51 trading plan decision months and months ago, and are worried the optics they will use of that trade will look bad once they disclose bad information days later. So I've had executives actually pull their plan, cancel the trade, because they're going to make too much money. Um, that's what's going on, in my belief, for many executives, not the flip side of the SEC is so concerned about. Yeah, I think in my experience, too, um, with the clients we work with, many of them are tending to err on the on the safe side, and they're, they're definitely disadvantaging themselves um, to avoid even the appearance of, of insider trading. Um, so yeah. let's see how this one came out. Um, only about a fifth of those who responded to that um, currently have a 10B51 plan in place. So I, know, I think you said, Greg, that what is it, over half of the S&P 500 um, have 10B51 plans that they're using for their executives? At least execu executives at those companies have, so it might not be all, right? So <clears throat> Right. So maybe our audience here might be a little uh, underrepresented with their 10B51 plans. Ben? Yeah, it's really interesting, Greg. You know, in, in investing, we talk about systemic risk and non-systemic risk, and the, the new rules certainly limit your ability to respond to, to systemic risk that has nothing to do with the, the company. So it's, you know, it, it might be, they might be avoiding making money like you, you mentioned, but also definitely limits the ability to just respond to the macro environment that's not company specific. A um, couple more questions, you know, you, you listed off um, where we stand with the proposed changes. Your firm commented on many of these these proposed changes, um, are these new rules inevitable? Uh, what's the what's the process from here? Yeah, so the rules are not final yet. Um, the SEC released um, them for comment, and the comment period is now closed. Under the SEC's uh, uh, disclosed schedule, they plan to have these new rules final by April of 2023, but it could be earlier or later. Uh, they don't always stick the deadlines uh, exactly. Um, I, I do believe the rules are inevitable um, in large part. I think Chairman Gensler and the SEC staff are very energized on this issue. While there may be some tweaks on the margins, particularly with respect to maybe clarifying language, uh, maybe modulating downward the disclosure obligations by issuers, um, I do believe these amendments will be part of the 10B51 framework by spring of next year, if not earlier. Based on the, the core elements that you do think will go through, um, are there anything, is there anything that um, individuals or companies can be doing now to prepare uh, for those core elements going through in the proposed changes? So I think for individuals, um, you should not enter into a 10B51 trading plan unless you intend to write it out, allow it to run its course. If you enter a plan, you should not trade outside the plan unless there is a unique circumstance that you can justify the trade. Why is that? Well, it's because rather than serve as an affirmative defense under the, the good faith language the SEC is proposing and will undoubtedly apply with the benefit of hindsight retroactively to trades before the, before the rules become final, um, both the SEC and the plaintiff's bar will argue that those trades outside of plans uh, modifications to plans and terminations of plans are evidence of a motivation to do something unexpected, unnatural, right, unusual, um, to support an inference of scienter, which is an intent to defraud. For individuals, I think the strength of the affirmative defense is getting weaker, while and, and the certainty of it is getting weaker, while the requirements to qualify for that affirmative defense are getting more stringent in the new proposed rules. I believe that what the staff is going to find are that some insiders may reasonably conclude that it's no longer worth it for them to implement 10B51 trading plans and not do it. Uh, for, for companies, 
I generally would wait in, until the final rules are adopted and see sort of what the contours are. Uh, the commission should provide sufficient time uh, once they become final before they become effective to sort of uh, get, get going on the, the disclosure obligations, et cetera. I'm also hopeful the SEC will um, hold off on a few of the amendments, the proposed rules, at least on the margins, or provide the needed clarifying language. And that guidance will help, I think, companies formulate their 10B51 trading plan and consider trading policies. So nevertheless, I think companies, I think, can do the following between now and, and April of next year. I think, um, one, you know, these onerous obligations um, are, you know, relative to the ever declining benefit of a, of a firm of defense may result in some issuers refusing to approve um, any 10B51 trading plans because there are very onerous disclosure obligations. Um, two, um, they should establish appropriate policies and procedures to ensure that the company reviews the rural 10B51 plans and any other trading arrangements for the Section 16 officers. I think they can begin to review the current uh, insider trading policies and plans and procedures with an eye to public disclosure, right? Your, your policy under one of the amendments you have to actually put on your website, your insider trading plan and policy, make sure that has been reviewed by counsel or other advisors to make sure it's proper for you know, public consumption. And then lastly, consider adopting an equity grant policy that provides for equity grants to be made on pre-established dates to avoid allegations by the SEC and others of spring loading those grants. I think those are the few things you can do now, and then we'll wait to see what we should do afterwards. Thanks, Greg. Uh, we're going to go to our, our fourth and final polling question, and then we're going to open it up for, for any additional questions. So feel free to type those in the chat. We've got about four minutes left here uh, before the top of the hour. Last polling question. Uh, based on the proposed SEC changes, does your company anticipate changing its insider trading policies? Just give it a few more seconds here. Thought I saw a response there for a second. There you go. About 33% say yes as of now. We'll see. We'll see how the the proposed changes come through and whether that impacts this question. Yeah. Got a few minutes left. If there's any any follow-up questions, go ahead and uh, enter this into the the chat. And I just want to take take a second also to to thank you, Greg. And Wilson Sincini, really, really appreciate you coming on and answering some of these questions. Certainly a lot of implications here uh, from a legal perspective and then also, you know, in terms of how we plan with clients around some of these issues. And uh, thanks for taking the time. My pleasure. Yeah, and while, while we're waiting to see if any final questions come in, um, <clears throat> I believe there's been a widget displayed uh, during the presentation. Um, you know, if you basically get in touch, get in touch with Greg directly, get in touch with Moss Adams if you have any questions about, uh, you know, personal questions for you or for your company about how all this may apply to you. Um, we're happy to, happy to consult. Couple questions in the chat, Aaron. Yeah, I'm seeing one here. Um, the question is, uh, this is a bit off topic, but what are the current penalties for a late form four filing? Uh, um, a slap on the wrist. Um, more often than not, the late form four filing, you explain to the SEC the reason for the delay and the staff does nothing about it. If it becomes um, pervasive or prevalent, you can get a books and records violation uh, from the SEC to the issuer or to the individual, but it's not a, a, a serious charge or a fraud-based claim of any kind. 
I think that was the answer they were looking for. Well, we've got a minute left. So if there's any other questions, please uh, go ahead and submit. There's one here. Uh, Greg, do you have any good reference points for the proposed changes? Any any good um, areas uh, that summarize the, the proposed changes? Or do you have a go-to for um, referencing when changes actually go through? Um, the SEC will certainly issue a press release when, when they have made the rules final. You can go to sec.gov and find that. Um, most of your outside advisors, whether it be your broker or uh, outside counsel, will likely have um, published client alerts on these issues. I know my firm has, I'm sure Moss Adams has as well. Um, and they'll likely uh, in include new ones once the, the rules become final. Um, so that, that's where I would look. Perfect. Well, we're just at 11. Thanks again, everyone, for joining and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thank you, Toby, Ben, Greg, and Aaron for a great presentation. Um, again, if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out uh, to our presenters via the speaker bio widget, or there is a another widget where you can elect to be contacted. Um, here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. And thank you all for joining us, and we hope you'll join us again next time. Thank you. Thank you.